Engineer Gold Mines is focused on the exploration and development of the historic high-grade Engineer Gold Mine situated 32 kilometers southwest of Atlan, British Columbia. Engineer Gold Mines is fully permitted for surface and underground exploration with the drill program now underway. Engineer Gold Mines Limited trades on the TSX Venture Exchange symbol EAU. For more information, please visit us at engineergoldmines.com. You're listening to HowStreet.com Radio, available online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. Welcome to HowStreet.com Radio, the online source for market opinions. Here is Jim Goddard. My guest is home ownership consultant Ross Kay from the WealthyHomeowner.ca, Canada's authority on home ownership. Welcome back to the show and happy Canada Day. And thanks for having me back and happy Canada Day to you and all your listeners. We start off with a listener question. Daniel asks, do you believe a significant price correction is still possible in the single-family detached entry-level segment for cities within a commuting distance of the greater Toronto area, that is Burlington, Barrie, Oshawa, etc., keeping in mind the new reality of many potential first-time home buyers that will now be able to work from home, which could increase the demand outside the GTA? And I would think perhaps outside the greater Vancouver and other big city centers as well. You know, this is a this is a question, or I guess a comment, or a theory um, that is going to be used again by organized real estate against home buyers across this nation. This is something uh, Daniel should know that uh, just uh, this week uh, I watched a uh, TD um, economics uh, video conference or video, video cast, whatever you want to call it, where they were was being hosted by Royal LePage, Phil Silver, the the CEO of Royal LePage, and I mean Phil has been a long time show uh, for his organization, you know, for for you know a long, long, long time. He's a guy that we used to laugh at at our uh, Monday morning office meetings uh, when I was uh, selling real estate. He was a guy we would, what, what did Soper have to say? And we'd all start laughing because most of this stuff was just so so outrageous. It could never be supported. And we knew what he was doing was trying to sell Royal LePage as a place for real estate sales reps to go work. That's what he was doing. And once, he, once you're working there, obviously he's trying to sell your services to the public. Choose Royal LePage versus everyone else. He was, he was on about this comment too. And, uh, and it just, I think what people need to do on this discussion, Jim, is we need to step back and think about outcomes before we start jumping to conclusions, okay? Think about potential out- outcomes and do some critical analysis of how you're thinking. We're hearing this this talk about Facebook and Twitter sending le- allowing people to work for home, from home. We're hearing talks about government offices allowing people to continue to work for home. That is then being cited as a reason for people to no longer live in Vancouver or Toronto, move to the suburbs where it's cheaper. You're going to need a home office, which you're not able to afford if you buy a home in those cities. Uh, so that's why people are going to move. Um, and I think what's missing from the conversation is the log- logical conclusion of that conversation, the logical understanding how business have operated for decades, if not centuries, which is to seek out the lowest cost of labor possible. So while government workers, those paid by taxpayer dollars, may be safe from job loss because of work from home, that is not the case for regular workers. That is not the case for workers who work at a Canadian bank who have been, who for a decade, have been ruthless in their attack on their employees. Now think about it. If these companies who are all talking about this, telework, work from home, if this were to take place, what they're effectively saying is we can outsource your job to somebody over the Internet. We don't need to see you face to face. We don't need to have your presence in the office. We don't even have need to have you living in the same city where we operate. We can do it all remotely. We can outsource your job tomorrow. We know we can outsource your job tomorrow. 
We know it so well that we're already announcing that, i.e. Facebook, Twitter. We may have to make a change in your remuneration as a consequence of you being able to live in a cheaper place, a place where your monthly housing costs are lower. Lower monthly housing costs, we're not going to have to pay you the same amount of uh, income that we were paying you because we believed you had to live in, for the sake of the argument, Toronto or Vancouver. This is really the consequence of this jump on the bandwagon philosophy that takes place. And unless you've been in an industry where this actively has taken place in the past, which, again, my perspective is I was involved in an industry that is always leading technological change. When I started in the real estate business, everybody worked at a real estate office. They went to the real estate office every single day. If you didn't come to the real estate office, your broker owner would be calling you and asking you where you were. You had an office space. If you didn't sell a lot of real estate, you were you were left in a cubicle uh, or with a group of other agents. As you sold more, you ended up getting your own office space. Then Remax came along, and real estate agents themselves got to rent their own office space within the brokerage office. Then... As revenue started to decline because of the great house price correction of the 90s, ah, all of a sudden, work from home started. Agents started coming into the office. The owners had to change their entire model. They had to find other ways to make money. They made cuts where it was needed. That is exactly what will be the outcome if we have this work from home movement starts. Any corporation under the current structure that our corporations are encouraged to work under which I will tell you personally, Jim, I disagree with this philosophy, but my opinion here is irrelevant. Uh, These corporations are going to look to cut their overhead anywhere possible. And when they're not, the manager is not staring the employee in the face every day in the coffee room or walking by them, seeing the pictures of their families on their desk or going out for a beer with them after work or not sending them that uh, birthday card, which is the office policy to make sure everybody gets a, a little piece of cake and, uh, and a birthday card on your, on your birthday, those relationships dwindle, and it becomes very easy for them to cut you off. Hey, our profits are down this month, Bank of Montreal. What are we going to do? Well, you know all those work-from-home employees. You know their jobs that they're doing? We could actually outsource those to India. We could actually outsource those jobs to China. And nobody would even know. The regular public wouldn't even know. Because, you know, we're no longer operating in your local branch any longer. So this is where you have to to, to look at where this conversation can go. And is that really or what the outcome of that would be in the end? So let's say that they start cutting. We're already going to be into a state of unemployment that we haven't seen uh, in a very, very long time. Even as when we we exit this lockdown and things are going back to whatever kind of normal uh, we look at when this is over, Um, businesses will not be making money. They'll be looking for a way to cut to cut costs. It's just the way it goes. So that's actually going to put a lower demand on the home ownership market in these outlying suburbs. It's also going to negatively impact home ownership wealth because as demand declines. So too do home prices. Initially, it happens with home buyers spending an aggregate less money, which gets misreported by organized real estate as falling home prices, which the consumer then believes and then expects a discount on the next home that they're going to buy. The same way that it works on the way up, it works on the way down. The question for Daniel is, when you're, when you're thinking about things like this, first of all, you gotta listen to the source. Where is he getting his understanding of this? Is this from Phil Soper? Is this from a, uh, uh, a, um, oh, Craig Alexander with, uh, with Remax? Is this from CMHC? Is this from some, someone who has a skewed view, like a, a reason to give you, uh, a direction to get you to buy a home in the suburbs? What, what is, what is the benefit for the person giving you this advice? Now, critically then, critically assess what they're talking about. How come we're not hearing what I just discussed, out in the public discourse right now. It is a danger, in my opinion. It is a danger for the worker, Canadian worker, 
to start working at home when you are on, when you are an employee. And I will also tell your, your listener, this is what else is going to happen. If you work from home, the employers are going to be able to start to encourage you to become independent contractors. They're going to tell you the reason you want to be an independent contractor is so that you can write off part of your home with Revenue Canada. So your net earnings or the amount of money that you have left in, left over at the end of the month is greater because you're going to pay a lower tax rate, lower taxes. That will be the second phase of this conversation. They will try to direct you to do something that's really in their best interest, but they want you to believe it's in yours. And they will find some reason that in the short term, it may look like it is in your best interest. When in the long term, your jog disappears or your risk increases, i.e. as an independent contractor, because then they can let you go at any minute without, uh, without any of the uh, labor laws applying. Again, this has all taken place in the real estate sector decades ago. This all took place. Independent contractor status came in in 1990. Okay, then it went across the rest of Canada. Um, the reason what the, 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 it was sold to the employees for for uh, a way to lower your ta- your uh, your taxes. In the end, it, it hurt people in the long term because it l- led to the destruction of the uh, the brokerage industry with. The remains are, are what you have today, a level of incompetence that is simply was incomprehensible uh, or comprehensible that that would ever have arrived in the Canadian uh, home trading infrastructure. Nobody in the 1980s would have ever thought the profession would have sunk to as low as it does today. Just it wouldn't have happened. Daniel, think about it. If, if they're going to allow you to work from home, there's a reason why they're going to do it. A, they're going to minimize their risk. B, they're going to be able to lower your 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 monthly your uh, your income. They're going to increase their their profits. That's what the idea is. If they're looking to increase their profits, if you have an opportunity for them, for them to outsource your job, they're going to do it. The only people, Jim, that are really protected in this situation are government workers, which is another divide that isn't being discussed anywhere in the press. There are two types of Canadians today. There are those who are get paid from taxpayer dollars, and then there are taxpayers. Taxpayers, right now, are at a total disadvantage to government workers. Most government workers did not see a decrease in pay this entire lockdown, while everyone else did. Government workers, sure, they may benefit from this because they could move to outside of the Vancouver or, to, or uh, outside of Vancouver or Toronto into a more affordable neighborhood. They may benefit from it, but then they're also going to benefit from falling home prices. It's the regular Canadians who are not government employees who are the ones that are going to pay the price. Don't listen to anybody who tells you this works out to your advantage without you looking at what's behind the scenes because there is always a reason that a message is being shared. I watched Phil Soper talk with TD Economist, and I watched him flinch Every single time she said something that he viewed as not being something that he could use to keep his Royal LePage sales reps working at Royal LePage. I also watched him spin with a little chuckle uh, any of her negative comments. And then I saw her react to, the, to his switch in total ignorance to what he was doing. Don't be fooled by those telling you that work at home is going to improve your life by allowing you to own a home in a cheaper city. What they're really telling you is your job is at risk. We'll have more with Ross K. right after this. Cypress Development Corp. is developing a world-class lithium resource in the heart of Clayton Valley, Nevada. The size of the resource makes the Clayton Valley project a premier asset with the potential to impact the future of lithium supply. Cypress Development Corp. trades on the TSX Venture Exchange, symbol CYP, the OTCQB, symbol CYDVF, and on Frankfurt, symbol C1Z1. For more information, please visit our website, cypressdevelopmentcorp.com. 
Media recognition from Bloomberg, Reuters, recycling trade publications, patented process for 100% recovery of critical metals, including cobalt, lithium, nickel, manganese, aluminum. American Manganese is focused on recycling lithium-ion batteries for electric vehicles. American Manganese trades on the TSX Venture, AMY, the U.S., AMYZF, and Frankfurt 2AM. For more information, visit AmericanManganeseInc.com or phone me, Larry Ray, at 778-574-4444. Welcome back. We're speaking with Ross K. Ross, this week, the U.S. Real Estate Association, the National Association of Realtors, announced May sales had skyrocketed 44%. Do you see a similar announcement across Canada's MLS system starting after Canada Day? Okay, well, I expect you're going to hear, you know, good things about June. Uh, so I don't think you're going to have... So starting after Canada Day, yeah, you're going to hear the monthly releases come out from the MLS systems for June sales. Um, of course, what Nair didn't tell anybody was is that the aggregated sales in uh, the way that Nair aggregates sales from MLS systems across the United States, uh, it's it's way, way, way more complicated than it is in Canada. I mean, there's 52 different states. Nair doesn't have access to all the state's data. In other words, the biggest MLS system in the United States is, does not even cooperate with Nair. The New York's... Uh, uh, Real Estate Brokers Association doesn't even cooperate with there. Um, they they have to add all these stats together from 20, 20, 52 different states with each state has, uh, you know, as, as many as a, a dozen MLS systems who are all competing against each other for talking points. And then they have reporting delays across all these hundreds of different uh, real estate boards and uh, they aggregate the data with NAIR, and it's a latent metric as it is. So what you're hearing from, from NAIR is an aggregation of basically their uh, April and May sales, uh, and they're coming up with this 44.3% gain. So, yeah, yeah, that, sure, the skyrocket 44.3%, but when you're coming off the floor, it's easy to, to, have, uh, to get two inches taller. Um, the Canadian MLS systems, now we're going to be into our uh, third, third and uh, and final uh, month of reporting uh, since the lockdown, and this will be the final where the delayed sales are going to be reported. As we enter July, we're into a plethora of changes to the Canadian home trading infrastructure that uh, home buyers really need to be aware of because the stories you're going to be told over the next week are not going to be applicable at the same time you're thinking about buying a house if, if you're active in the market right now. So we have July 1st. We've got a change to, uh, to CMHC's uh, lending where they're going to, they're going to reduce the uh, gross debt service maximum to 35%. That's going to have a consequence across the country as well. I'm not going to discuss what that consequence is right now, but it's going to have a consequence. You're going to hear June sales have increased. The warning for everyone is, is if you hear how prices have increased. Because when you hear about prices increasing, uh, as we said in the show before, house prices don't increase in, in two months. They don't, house prices do not change. House prices do not go up in 60 days. They never have. They never will. Um, the data is irrefutable. There are, there are literally tens of millions of transactions to prove this point. Um, but I think when you're looking for the United States and you're trying to compare that to Canada, you have to understand you can't do that. You have two totally sets of numbers, two totally different home trading infrastructures. And I'll explain it to your listeners in this manner. In Canada, there is the Canadian home trading infrastructure. Okay? That is, a, that is, an, that is, how the overall Canadian home ownership market, home trading market works. Within that infrastructure, what makes up that infrastructure are provincial infrastructures, which are all unique and all different. Within each province, there are municipal home trading infrastructures, which again are totally different. It's why house price change can't be calculated similarly from one municipality to another, even within its own province, let alone from coast to coast. When you hear the uh, National Association of Realtors announce things, uh, statistics about the American housing market, you have to understand that Mr. Yun, uh, basically the Canadian or the American equivalent to Greg Plum, 
um, he, he has a job to fulfill, and his job is to make his members uh, earn commissions, same as clumps were in here in Canada. He has no obligation, legally, ethically, or professionally, to represent the interests of the American public, any more than Greg Klump had none to represent the interests of the Canadian public. These are all stories because of the way data is aggregated, it's not adjusted, it's not accurately calculated, that is designed solely to make the MLS house price pyramid scheme work. That is the sole goal of these real estate uh, trading associations, the MLS systems they operate, and the entire staff that they hire. It's to keep the pyramid scheme working so that you will pay commission, outrageous commission, to someone to work for you for basically 24 hours. In Canada, of course, the commissions payable are substantially higher. So you got to take that into account, that into account too. So as you hear, June sales come out uh, later this week even, and then into early next week. Yes, expect, expect to hear the pontificating, the, the standing on on uh, the bench, hollering out home that Canadian housing market has roared back. Bidding wars have returned. House prices are, are going up again. And I'll tell you, folks, not a single home in Canada has increased in price in the last 60 days. We'll have more with Ross Kay right after this. Avon Resources Limited is a gold exploration company with significant projects in British Columbia and the Yukon, trading on the TSX Venture Exchange, symbol ABN, and the OTCQB, symbol ABNAF. Surrounded by world-class gold deposits and mines, Avon's 23,000 hectares Forest Kerr Gold Project is located in the heart of the Golden Triangle in northwestern BC. For more information, visit us at avonresources.com. Don't miss out. Stay informed. Receive the HowStreet.com Weekly Recap with thought-provoking podcasts, radio, and articles delivered to your inbox. Sign up for the HowStreet.com Weekly Recap on our homepage at HowStreet.com. Welcome back. We're chatting with Ross K. Ross, CMHC July 1st lowers the maximum gross debt service ratio from a maximum of 39% down to 35 what impact do you see this having once Canadians begin to stop sheltering in place? And what does it mean anyway? I'd like that explained. Okay, so gross debt service ratio, when it comes to CMHC or the real estate industry, is how much of your income you can spend on the following items. Your mortgage, monthly mortgage payment, taxes, your monthly property taxes, to your your municipality, and uh, your heat, which is generally calculated at about uh, 150 bucks is what they calculate it at per month. If you live in a condo, it's also 50% of your condo fee. Those items added together, the CMHC will insure your loan if you only 35% of your pre-tax earning goes towards servicing that monthly debt. So in other words, if you made $10,000 a month, CMHC says, before taxes, CMHC, CMHC says you can spend uh, $3,500 a month. In in the past, or for the last few years, I guess maybe almost for the last decade, CMHC had allowed a 39% maximum. But when you look, if you get into the granularity of mortgage data, you're, you're going to see almost nobody had a 39% um, gross debt service maximum. Now, the banks were, were bumping 36, 37, but you didn't see very many people fool enough, foolish enough to go and borrow at 39%. If they borrow at 39%, maybe they're going to put a tenant in the house to help offset some of that cost. But Canadian home buyers are not as stupid as everyone in the media and the uh, housing analyst profession wants to make them out to be. Canadian home buyers are smart people. They are prudent people. They don't make the decisions everybody out there is saying that they make. It's one of the greatest frauds ever committed on, uh, 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 insults ever committed against Canadian, Canadians in general is this saying how, you know, bad they are with their money. Generally speaking, Jim, I'll tell you this. I really can't remember in the thousands of homes that we sold selling to anyone over a 34% gross debt service ratio. We preferred people to be around 32%. We also preferred that if 
if they were go- if their job was going to have an increase in wage over the next couple of years, which would effectively lower your gross debt service ratio. We had no problem with the first year having people being tight for cash. That's that's really the way that you buy a house. It's the way that you should buy a house. You know, don't go out for dinner. You want to build habits in that first year of home ownership that are going to carry you through for the rest of your life. Yeah, you're not going to order out pizza three times a week. You're only going to order it once. That's a decision you make when you buy a home. CMHC is is lowering 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 the debt service ratio here. But what you have to understand, Jim, is that this debt service ratio, the way that they calculate it, really means nothing in in 2020. Uh, th- that all ended. Uh, the OSFI ensured that it ended. It, it really doesn't matter. It, it, it's really absurd. It, it's really, Jim, in all fairness, it's disgusting, the fees that CMHC charges. And your listeners are going have, will have heard dozens of hundreds even possibly of articles about how the taxpayer is on the hook with CMHC. How if foreclosures happen, CMHC, the taxpayer is on the hook. And I just shake my head because I, it's another instance of even CMHC itself being so clueless to how the home trading infrastructure Canada in Canada works. So let me explain something to those out there who are starting to hear these foreclosure discussions, how foreclosures are going to start this fall or next year, all these stories, how the taxpayer is on the hook for billions of dollars. It could wipe out the government. I mean, there's just so many crazy stories out there. And let me explain to you why. CM, we don't call, meaning our firm doesn't call CMHC mortgage insurance. We don't call it mortgage default insurance. We don't call it lender default insurance. We call it monthly mortgage interest deferral payments. That's what we call it. We've called it that since I started in the business. Now, this is the perspective that you need to have when you're critically assessing people commenting on CMHC, taxpayers' liability with CMHC, and foreclosures. This is the perspective. When I started selling real estate in the late 80s and during the great housing correction of the 1990s, at the start of the period, CMHC had only three months of interest deferred that they could pay back from your CMHC insurance payable, your policy. So when you paid CMHC insurance, we called it a policy. And that policy covered a certain amount of mortgage interest over a period of time. It was only three months, Jim, back then. In other words, you paid 3% mortgage insurance on $100,000 was $3,000. Three three months of interest payable at the beginning of a $100,000 loan was over $3,000. Fast forward to the last five-year window. So I'm not even going to talk about today, okay, where interest rates are, you can get it now at 1.99%. Uh, Take the aggregate of all the mortgages booked over the last five years, and you look at the average interest rate with that is, which I'm not going to tell you here because that's a proprietary calculation we're able to do because that information uh, professional users are able to use for uh, investing purposes. But when we take that and we calculate based on the current 4% premium, $4,000 per hundred, that CMHC charges, right now, CMHC's outstanding mortgage book would be covered for 20 months. I want your listeners to hear what I just said. People are paying so much mortgage insurance, default insurance, CMHC insurance, to CMHC when they took out the loan over any time in the last five years, that CMHC could pay the interest payable on your mortgage for 20 months without losing a dime, without losing a dime. That's everyone who had mortgage insurance with CMHC as a first-time buyer over the last five years, all of it, 20 more months. We're talking into 2022. Okay, and then when you get down to the granular level of the previous five years, so in other words, up to 10 years back, the payment gets even stronger, even though the the rate increase was in 2014. So you got to you got to average all that out. Now you can imagine, Jim, 
paying for insurance today in 2020 that's going to protect the government for 24 months versus paying back in 1990 the government only for three months of coverage. It's insane. It's absurd from our viewpoint. When we hear these commentary come out about CMHC risk, we just shake our heads and we say, what are these people talking about? Get a calculator out. CMHC has collected more fees in the last five years alone than it would cost to cover the mortgage debt for the entire CMHC mortgage portfolio for over two years. This is why the, the regular Canadian public doesn't aware how CMHC works. CMHC will work with you as a delinquent homeowner, someone who's delinquent in their mortgage, to get you out of that buying any way possible. They will work with you with up to six months, and they do so with a smile on their face. Why? Because they have you paid so much insurance that they can cover the interest on in your mortgage for two years. They can keep giving the bank your, 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 the interest on your mortgage every single month, and it won't hurt them at all. They've already collected more than that. Any risk to CMHC or foreclosures is solely on the backs of home buyers who have paid an exorbitant amount of CMHC insurance that in 1990 would have only covered you for three months, you're paying at a rate now that covers you for over 20 months. Again, when you're hearing these commentaries, when you're hearing these comments about CMHC changes, about the, the rules, you have to go back and critically assess the person who's making the comments. Is there a hidden agenda that this person has? Is it that they want you to trust them so that someday you go out and buy a home from them? Is it someone who hopes to sell a product to the government because they want to get, um, get, get into that side of the real estate business? What is the motivation behind it? I come on this show and ex ex try to explain things as best I can without giving up our IP. When I talk gross debt service ratio, okay, we don't even use that calculation because that calculation doesn't work. We have what's called an essential debt service ratio. It is a totally different calculation. This is the same way that when you look at the RBC's housing affordability surveys, the surveys that they send out to every, that they've done for like 30 years, you know, it's, a, it, they've been the laughing stock. You know, decades ago, they were the laughing stock of the real estate brokerage industry. Today, it apparently, we're the only ones that left that laugh at them. Housing affordability is not measured the way that they measure it. They're clueless. The, the uh, methodology that they apply to the affordability uh, calculation is not how Canadians buy homes. It's not who buys homes. It isn't. Um, cha it doesn't change for each of the provincial uh, home trading infrastructures or the municipal home trading infrastructures within that province, which is all required to be done to give an honest assessment of affordability. Doesn't happen. Why? Because RBC's modus operandi, their reason for, or their reason for, uh, releasing these affordability charts is solely so that you'll go get a mortgage from Royal Bank. They want to spin it in the best way possible. Whether that is in a way that spins you into fear, you better buy a house now because it's going to be unaffordable tomorrow, or they spin it with, um, oh, this city is a more affordable city. Move here, get a mortgage from us. They're going to lend you the exact same amount of money no matter where you buy. They don't care. All of these calculations are no longer relevant. They became irrelevant when OSFI changed the rules. Everything changed. They were irrelevant then because it didn't take into account uh, regional differences. They're irrelevant now because of, of those regional differences, plus, again, how the OSFI rule changes impacted the, the housing market. There is no comparison. You cannot compare someone buying a home, a home buyer with $100,000, buying a home in Quebec, in the city of Quebec, in Quebec, versus Vancouver in British Columbia. There is no comparison. Those two families both earn $100,000. But CMHC treats those two families totally differently. One thing CMHC does do, and that is they now collect 20 
Well, if you did it this, if you bought at today's mortgage rate, they're going to collect from you two years worth of mortgage interest payable as an insurance fee. Two years. Canadian taxpayers are on the hook for nothing. CMHC has is, is, is reaped, in, reaped in billions and billions and billions of dollars. Now, if CMHC didn't keep that money and they gave it to the Liberal government, who then went and did something with that money, that's CMHC's problem, not the taxpayers. Because Canadian home buyers paid more than enough for any consequence of even this lockdown is going to result in. And when we talk about foreclosure talk, think about it, folks. Do you not think if things got bad, CMHC would not scratch their heads, wink, wink, nudge, nudge, hey, we've got 24 months of interest we, kept, we, we, we uh, collected from these guys when they bought their insurance. Let's do whatever we can to keep them in that house to stave off foreclosure. Let's do whatever we can to make sure we're not responsible. We don't look like we made bad lending decisions or bad insuring decisions. And now with the new rules that have been in place since the fall of 2016, it's literally laughable that anyone assumes foreclosures for that group of home buyers is going to take place. The only people who have to worry are the Canadian banks or the alternative lenders who lended money on unsecured, uninsured mortgages because they don't have that mortgage interest, that two years of mortgage interest put away in their bank to be able to use to keep you up to date. Only CMHC insured people, loans, mortgages paid that amount of interest up front. In 1990, it was three months of interest you paid up top and up front. Today, as of today, you would pay up to two years worth of interest up front. That's how you have to take the contact of CMHC and foreclosures. Ross, thank you so much for chatting with us and have a great Canada Day. And a great Canada Day and celebration to you too, Jim. My guest has been home ownership consultant Ross K from the wealthy homeowner.ca. If you have questions for Ross or any of our other guests, you can send them to info at howstreet.com. Our YouTube channel is Talk Digital Network. Find us on Twitter at How Street. We're also on Facebook. I'm Jim Goddard. Thank you for listening. Comments made on HowStreet.com radio are an expression of opinion only and should not be construed in any matter whatsoever as recommendations to buy or sell any financial instrument at any time. Available online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com, HowStreet.com radio is a production of HowStreet Media Incorporated.